So, let's talk about sex. When I was in my late teens and early 20s, I thought a lot about sex. But although I was thinking a lot about sex, the thoughts I was having weren't particularly sexy. I wasn't thinking about things like what I'd like to do or who I'd like to do it with or how I'd go about making that happen. No, I was thinking questions more along the lines of, how can I be more sexy? If I hook up with that guy I like, will he be able to tell that I'm inexperienced? Will people think I'm a slut? Why isn't my life unfolding more, than, more like it would if I was a character on a sitcom? Am I normal? What is normal, anyway? I'd grown up on a diet of sex in the city and women's magazines, and I believed that most people my age were dining at an all-you-can-eat sexual buffet. You know the kind of thing I'm talking about, going out on a date with someone you met over OkCupid on a Wednesday, snogging a stranger on the dance floor when you go out on a Saturday night, having sex so often that going 40 days and 40 nights without it was a major act of willpower instead of, you know, just what happens when you're single. That wasn't what my sex life looked like at all, although I tended to cover that up by doing things like making dirty jokes or just saying really, really quiet and hoping that people would fill in the blanks in the most positive way possible. And if I'd stopped to think about it and look beyond my neuroses for more than a couple of minutes, I would have realised that pretty much no one I knew was living a sex life that looked the way that I imagined it did. But I didn't stop to think about that for reasons that I'll get into in just a moment. Today I want to talk to you about some of the things that we believe about sex and why we believe them. I want to look at why, despite the fact that we live in an era that is more sexually free than ever before, so many of us are still anxious and insecure when it comes to sex. And I want to introduce you to the idea of the sex myth. Um, the idea that um, who you are can be found in what you do in the bedroom. If you're anything like I was when I was younger and you get a lot of your information about sex from media and popular culture, you probably think that we're living in an age of unprecedented sexual hedonism. Or as the Daily Mail put it in a recent article, that we are on an unstoppable march into a moral wasteland, full of things like casual sex and internet pornography and Fifty Shades of Grey. Now, you might not make the same moral judgments about these things as the Daily Mail would. You might think, for example, that casual sex is a great thing, that it's fun and an expression of our natural instincts. You might think that porn is a great way to explore different desires that you might have. You might think that, if anything, Fifty Shades of Grey is way too tame. But if you're like most people, you probably accept these things as reasonably accurate depictions of what's going on in the modern sexual landscape. And that's completely understandable, because it's a story that we hear over and over again. It wasn't until shortly before my 25th birthday that I began to imagine that the story might be different. I was walking home from a party one night with my friend Monica when all of a sudden she turned to me out of the blue and she said, you know, Rachel, Come May, it will be two years since I've had sex. And it'll be one year since I've kissed anyone. I don't think I said anything about it at the time, but I was shocked. Because Monica, you see, is pretty awesome. She's confident, she's charismatic, she's adventurous, and she was a lot of fun. She was the kind of person who always stayed out late on a Saturday night, because you never knew what would happen if you were out, but you always knew what would happen if you stayed in. Uh, this was a woman who, only a couple of years before this conversation, had made little badges reading a five dollar pash, uh, that's Australian for snog or kiss, and she'd worn those badges out to nightclubs in the hope that someone would pash her. In short, she was about as far from the stereotype of the shy, uptight wallflower as you could get. If anyone ought to be living the wild and crazy 20-something sex life TM, it was her. And yet she wasn't. So I did what any self-respecting journalist would do. I wrote an article about it. <laughs> Not just about my conversation with Monica, but about stereotypes about young people and sex more generally. Were we really going down on each other in club bathrooms, as that magazine I read had told me? Or were we dropping our trousers like G-stringed baboons in estrus, as a rather witty, if inaccurate, journalist in my local Sydney newspaper had put it. 
And what happens when you write an article is that you have a lot of conversations. Not just with the people you're interviewing for the story, but with every single person that you come across while you're writing it. Like most people, I'd had honest conversations about sex with my friends before. But writing about it meant that suddenly everyone wanted to talk to me about their sex lives. <laughs> One girl I knew, who was traffic stopping hot, felt anxious and insecure because the guy she was dating didn't want to have sex with her. He had good reasons for doing this, he wanted to remain absent until he got married, but that didn't change the way that it impacted her on an emotional level. Um, another person didn't know where her clitoris was, despite the fact that she'd been sexually active since she was 16. Now, I'm not saying that everybody was completely sexually clueless or that no one was getting laid at all. Most of the people that I spoke to, and most of the hundreds I've spoken to since, as I've travelled around the United Kingdom, uh, the United States, Canada and Australia, were sexually active. At least in the sense that they had had sex at some point in their life. Um, sometimes they'd had a lot of sex. One guy told me over dinner, and he was in his early 20s, that he'd had more than 300 sexual partners. But this really was not typical. That sexual buffet that I mentioned back at the beginning of this talk, yeah, um, in most cases, it wasn't really happening. Uh, my own interviews and observations are backed up by quantitative research into young people's sexual behaviours as well, the most comprehensive of which have come out of the United States. The Online College Social Life Survey, a survey of more than 19,000 American undergraduates, found that the average college student hooks up, uh, that's young person speak for everything from kissing through to intercourse and whatever else you want to do, um, with approximately six or seven people over four years of university. Of those, they'll have sex with about 40%, and uh, one in four undergraduates won't hook up at all. Meanwhile, the National Longitudinal Survey of Adolescent Health found that the most common number of sexual partners in any given year for an unmarried 18 to 23 year old, and that's awfully specific, so needs a lot of speaking out. Anyway, that, the most common number was, wait for it, one. And the next most common number after that was zero, followed by two. But while numbers are important, and it would be great if we could talk about them more realistically, they're not really the point here. The problem isn't just that we think that people are having X amount of sex with Y amount of people and doing Z in the bedroom. The problem is that we think that the amount and type of sex that people are having is deeply important. That it says something essential, not only about who we are as a culture, but about who each of us are as individuals. And that's not just a result of internet pornography or watching too much How I Met Your Mother. It's a result of something I've called the sex myth. So what is the sex myth? Well, the sex myth is the reason why if I tell you that the average person drinks four glasses of water a day, and I just made that statistic up for the purposes of this conversation, but it doesn't matter that I made it up because the chances are you're not really particularly going to care. But if I tell you, as the most recent edition of UK Cosmopolitan recently told me, that the average 18 to 29 year old has sex 112 times a year, right now you're either going to be patting yourself on the back or you'll be feeling like a total loser. Or if I tell you, as I just did, that most people have sex with zero, one or two people in any given year, it's the reason why you might now be sitting here, and you had sex with, say, eight people last year, it's the reason why you might now be sitting here thinking, oh crap, maybe I should keep my pants on. Or maybe you're thinking, what the hell is wrong with everyone else? The sex myth teaches us that sex is uniquely important, that it offers a window into who we really are, underneath all of that pesky culture and civilization stuff. The sex myth says that, sex, that our sex lives reveal not only our desirability, but our value as human beings. That in the details of what we do in the bedroom, we can find uh, the quality of our relationships, we can find how intimate other people want to be with us, and we can also find the secrets or uh, the, the key to our social success or our lack thereof. And whether you're a man or a woman, gay or straight, 20 years old or 50 years old, a liberal or a conservative, the sex myth is what shapes our views of sex. 
Historically speaking, the sex myth has primarily been used to get us not to do things. So if you had sex outside of marriage uh, with someone of the same gender or you liked to use whips and chains, you weren't just doing the wrong thing. You're a bad person. You're a pervert. And those messages still exist to an extent. I refer you to the Daily Mail article that I showed you earlier. But today those messages are accompanied by another set of stories. That if you're not having sex, you're a loser or a prude. That if you're not accruing a reasonable amount of sexual partners, you're wasting your youth or you don't know how to have fun. So what does your sex life reveal about you? The famous British sociologist Anthony Giddens has argued that we find our identities not just in, um, the, not, not in the details of what we do, but in our capacity to be able to tell a coherent narrative about who we are. In other words, we like there to be a clear, neat story. So if, like the girl that I mentioned before, you're a hot girl who really values being hot, it's going to be distressing if the guy that you're going out with doesn't want to have sex with you. Especially if you've been brought up to believe, like most women have, that guys want sex at any time, in any place, right? If you're a religious person who doesn't believe in sex before marriage, but you have sex before marriage anyway, you might tell yourself that it's an accident, that it doesn't really count, even if it's an accident that keeps happening again and again. If you're a bloke's bloke or a girly girl, how could you be gay? Research shows that the sex myth doesn't just shape the way we think about our sex life, it can also shape our behaviour, as we change what we do to fit the image of the person that we would like other people to think that we are. So maybe you've hooked up with people that you're not overly attracted to, just because you think that you need to be sexually active in order to be a modern, empowered woman, or to be, you know, a man's man. Or maybe, on the other hand, you're holding back on talking about things that you actually would like to do because you don't want your partner to think you're a freak. But here's the thing. The sex myth is bullshit. And it's not just media and popular culture that perpetuate it either. We actually do a lot to perpetuate it ourselves in our everyday interactions and conversations. I'm talking about things like, say, you hung out with someone that you really like over the weekend, and then on a Monday, your friend or your colleague or your acquaintance asks you, asks you if you got any action over the weekend. And if you're like a lot of people, you won't necessarily actually answer that question with a yes or no. You'll just smile and let them fill in the blanks and hopefully think that you did score. Or I'm talking about situations where you might round up or round down the number of people that you've had sex with or hooked up with in order to fit in with the group. Or situations where you make kind of offhand remark about virgins or about sex workers or about people with STIs without considering that there might be someone at the table who fits the category that you're talking about and who might be hurt by what you've said. And while things like magazines and movies and TV shows can do a lot to shape what we think is normal when it comes to sex, I'd argue that it's actually those micro-interactions that we participate in ourselves that play the bigger, more important role. It's easy to call bullshit, after all, on something that you read in Zoo magazine, but it's much harder to call bullshit when you hear those same messages coming from someone who you care about and whose opinion you value. Now, I'm not saying that you have to tell your friends that they're full of crap, because who knows, they may not be. But what I would challenge you to do is to stop perpetuating your own crap. To be a little bit more critical about what you see and a little bit more honest in what you say. This isn't just about creating a more authentic dialogue around sexuality. It's about expanding our ideas about what is normal to encompass a broader range of people and experiences. It's about challenging the, the sex myth and the notion that your desirability and your sex life say, you say more about who you are than your friendships, your talents, your, your compassion for other people. And it's about redefining what we understand as sexual freedom to encompass not just the right to do the things that you do want to do, but the right not to do the things that you don't want to do, 
or um, to just not do them because they're just not happening in your life at this particular point in time. And to be able to not do them without that affecting who you are, without it making you not okay. Because here's the thing, you actually are okay. And as the slide behind me says, the sex myth is bullshit. Thank you very much.